feel Now that you stepped into my enemy My night is complete Now that you're finally here And a part of it And you like your lie The garden of my sleep Cause there is in my heart Some kind of joy I must not see See, my dear Every time I see Here we are. Who's going to talk? Steven can't hear anything. Well, sometimes when you're in a show, you never know what's going to go on. That's what's happening here right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm here I'm here somewhere. I know that. I, I I think everybody can hear me okay. Yeah. Yes, we can yeah, hear wonderful. you. I'm just not on screen yet. Our our producer is going to figure that out. I think. But uh, welcome everybody, and uh, for those of you who are hearing the sultry sounds of my voice, <laughs> my name is to you from uh, Canada. Yes. And uh, we've got some great storytelling that's going to happen today. This is, I guess you could say, chapter two in five days of live training. And, uh, okay, there we go again. And we'll just keep moving along. That's the one thing about live. You just keep moving forward. If you miss that note on the keyboard, you just keep playing. And, and, and it's okay if they notice. You just keep playing anyway. So I'm just going to get things started underway here as we get ready to do some storytelling. And we've got some fantastic storytellers uh, here. Uh, we're going to start off by welcoming all the way from sunny California, Linda Sunshine West. Thanks for being here, Linda. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> and Fawns Chamberlain, there's a, a, a story and a half. He's actually an author uh, recently of his new book. We'll be happy to share that as well. Uh, joining us from Cambridge. Thanks for being here, Fonz. That's good being here. Yeah, and Joe Shepard. Uh, Joe, um, actually, you and I have just met about 20 minutes ago for the first time, and you're coming to us from Ireland. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, David, great to be connected. And Fonz and uh, Linda, great to be on with you today to listen to some stories. And hey, as if by magic, David, we can now see you in the studio. So hey. it's, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, lots of stories. And what a great story to start with about, you know, how right. storytelling goes. There you go. <laughs> when I teach my students at the college, I tell them, be prepared for things not to work. <laughs> if you can yes, do that. that works. You'll, you'll be fine, right? And again, I'm coming to you uh, here from uh, Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, uh, which is also connected to the village of Point Edward, which is the Blue Water Bridge you see behind me here. And our friend uh, Stephen Healy, who's producing today, uh, joining us in the United Kingdom. Um, well, Linda, I'd like to st uh, start things off with you. I guess we'll do the round table style here today. And um, you're like a, uh, you've got a lot of titles really, but one of them is your collaboration strategist, right? Explain exactly what that is. You know, it's interesting that uh, collaboration is something that I've done probably most of my life, but didn't know I was doing it. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, so some of the stories that I'm going to share today actually kind of relate to collaboration. How did you get into, a, a situation where you were able to propel yourself forward because of the people that you're connected with. So like some, some of the people I've had opportunities to interview are like the president of Mexico. And I'm gonna share how that happened. That was like my, oh my God, this is like my Barbara Walters moment, you know, when that <laughs> happened. And like Kevin Harrington, Jack Canfield, you know, Les Brown, Sharon Lecter, I've interviewed some really, really amazing people that have really touched my life in such an incredible way. But beyond that is how did I help how did I help others to be able to collaborate with them? So that's why I'm going to be sharing you know, part of that today as well. Yeah, perfect. 
And uh, Fonz, now over to you. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, let's talk a little bit about your new book. And uh, boy, we could just do a whole show on you, I think. <laughs> um, I haven't done that much, really. <laughs> no, um, I'm crazy. Uh, that's the best way to start it. Um, but I'm an historian in Cambridge, so I share the history there with groups, uh, lectures, schools, and through online chats as well and my website and yeah i've just released my new book uh which is on the on an ebook form at the moment paperback coming soon and it's the first of a series looking at different subjects to do with cambridge and i've took a bit of a different approach because a lot of the history books in cambridge are either just loads of pictures or tons of writing. So I've combined it to two. Let's less writing, but more but more detail of what they're talking about, round pictures. So it's not overbearing and not under visual neither. You could right, say. Right, right, right. And what's the name of the book? Uh, it's um well it's the first this the series is called Discover Cambridge, but the first works uh the first one's called A Journey Through Time. So it's looking at events through the history of the city. Yeah. So a uh, key points that help shape what the city is today. And that that's the first book. It's actually on discount at the moment. It's at two ninety nine in that's pounds if anybody wants to buy one right. on Amazon. <laughs> Okay, I and and uh, I just got started on it the other day. I have the book. Really? And, uh, what do you think? I'm, what do you think of it? Well, I, I just got started. Like I think it was about two, uh, three days ago. Now I just got started, so I'm not that far in. So I'm I'm enjoying it so far. I can honestly say that. And uh, um, I I got it be like pre-sale kind of thing. So I was excited right. for. It. And I can say I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> when the when the paperback comes out, I'll send you a signed copy. <laughs> <laughs> love that. I love that. Well, I'm looking forward to more stories. Joe, let's uh, carry on with you now and uh, tell everybody who you are. Uh, Joe Shepard. I've uh, been living in Macon Island now for six years. Um, I spent a long time in the UK uh, British forces, um, sort of worked in some pretty strategic levels, uh, mentoring and coaching an Iraqi chief of police, set up his police force, that sort of stuff, um, global head of information and knowledge management and exploitation. Um, regional police commander, all of those type of things though, just involve people and involving people on their journey and learning stories from them because it's the yeah. memory, you're creating those memories from them. <clears throat> Two and a half years ago, uh, in semi-retirement, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to connect with like-minded people involved in rugby around the globe. So be like version one, uh, somebody said, have a look at this, this would be great. No Facebook page, no nothing, just this aspiration to speak to people about learning stories about their journey, why they follow their teams, what it's like going to games, you know, what, you know, that, that bringing the globe together one person at a time. Two and a half years on, <clears throat> excuse me, when COVID kicked in four months ago, I had a, a weekly show that was going great, you know, anything between four and 12,000 views, all right for a little tiny, you know, non-professional streamer uh, like me, that was good. Rugby stopped, what do I do? I expanded. So in four months, we've created some web pages for new shows. By the end of September, we'll have eight new shows on the go as well uh, and on a monthly cycle, and it's connecting the globe one person at a time. We've taken Facebook forums. We're doing joint ventures with them and bringing people in. So current and former players, coaches, administrators, ordinary fans, and doing uh, co-hosting with them because I'm a big fan of, you know, take a focus off yourself. A lot of these shows I'll just, um, I'll do like Stephen is today. I'll produce. Um, and then I'll just host a couple um, and get people to engage and to explain what their journey and their story is and, and, and got a great story to tell you afterwards. That's something happened a few weeks ago. And it's just fab, isn't it? You know, it's, in, in, you know, in Ireland, we have a, a, a word uh, called uh, the, uh, the Kranaki, which is uh, the Shanaki, sorry, which is the uh, storyteller. And down through the history of time, Every country, every region's always had somebody that told stories. And this is how these stories grow. That's a Christmas group from a whole pile of different stories and coming through. And it's that sort of thing that really excites me that, you know, you, you engage with people that 
you know, I've got about 100 panelists across the globe, right, that I can call on regularly. 98% of those people I've never met. In the next 10 years, 80 or 85% 80 or 85% of those people I will never meet. But you know what? Some have become really, really good friends. I know more about them than I do through their stories. And isn't that fab? Live is just the same way as years, you know, in the 1800s, we used to sit around, not me personally, I'm not that old, maybe Stephen, sorry, Stephen. <laughs> um, used to sit around a, a, a pot where the old one would tell a story and we'd all take that and then the story would be embellished a little bit and it would go down. Nothing's changed. We're just using a different platform for it. It just keeps going. It's fab. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. And for all of those uh, uh, of you who are watching, you can see what you're in for here today. We're coming around the globe uh, here today with different stories. And uh, myself, my name is David Burroughs, obviously, and uh, I have been a live streamer for about 10 years, been doing my show a community show that I do here in Sarnia Lampton, promoting the community and uh, uh, involved. I'm a sports announcer. I'm involved in radio. I do some motivational speaking and I've met some really cool people, had some really great interviews with some very well-known musicians and politicians. And um, so definitely a list of stories. I could probably write a book. I actually, I've started writing my book, Fonz. Uh, I, I have a title. <laughs> <laughs> that's as far as I've gotten. That's the, um, that's the best style in place. Yeah, well, it's called you got to have an episode one. So uh, copyright that. But uh, so lots of stories to be told here today. Now, and I, I just want to start off uh, before we get to those stories by looking. I just want to look at you, the audience, for just a moment. And, you know, you might be watching this thinking, you know, uh, here, we've, we've got some pretty neat people here today. Wow, these are going to be some amazing stories. And they will be. But don't think for a second that you don't have a story because everybody has a story. And sure, you might think, uh, you, you know, he's a police officer. So, wow, I've got some great stories. And well, I just hear what you've got a story in there somewhere and, you know, deep down that you've got that story. And the key is to be able to share it. Right. And and uh, I've always said about live stream, I truly believe live streaming can change the world. I really do. And we've been able to connect with so many people, um, you know, uh, people here today I've connected with and become friends with. Joe and I have just met. We're just establishing a relationship. Stephen, who's producing. We have a great friend. There's so many people. There, 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 there really is the only borders are the ones you put up yourself now. So be thinking about your story. And I know getting in front of the camera, uh, you know, how's my hair, all that stuff. Don't worry about it. But that's another uh, that's another day. But be thinking about your story as you listen to the stories of our experts here today. Linda, uh, let's come back to you now and and start storytelling. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You know, it's interesting. I never saw myself as a storyteller. You know, so anybody who's listening today, um, if you resonate with any of our stories, just know that we all started as babies. We couldn't even talk, right? And so as life went on and I met new people and I observed different people of how they crafted their story, I started paying attention. How are these people telling their stories? One of my mentors, Greg Reed, he's the millionaire mentor. And I met him through an event he was speaking at. And I was so captivated by every word he was sharing. He is a master storyteller. And so I was like, I want to be around that person, you know? So I made myself insert myself into his life in different ways. He was putting on an event called Secret Knock. And I was like, I'm, I got to go to this event because I need to be around this guy. What ended up happening was by being hanging around him, I got to meet his friends and their friends. So some of his friends include people like I mentioned earlier, you know, Vicente Fox, the president of Mexico. And I was at secret event, secret knock, and I was sitting in the front row, which was actually out of character for me. I'm one of those who likes to sit in the back of the room. I don't like to talk to anybody. I'm a very shy person, believe it or not. I'm very shy, but I force myself to do these things, to get in front of people, to, um, to jump out of my comfort zone on a regular basis. I faced a fear every single day for a year in 2015. Did that change my life? Boy, did it. So in 2015, I was at a secret knock, which is this event for entrepreneurs. It's a very expensive event. It's a very exclusive event, but I paid my money and I showed up. One of the speakers on the second day was Frank Shankwitz. You might not know the name, but you might know the organization Make-A-Wish Foundation. 
He founded and created the Make-A-Wish Foundation. As I heard him speaking, he was up on the stage. He was telling his story about he had a, he had a really tough childhood. His mother left him, his father, you know, and divorced. And there's this whole story. There's actually a movie about it called Wish Man, which I ended up becoming an executive producer in that film, which is really exciting for me. But as Frank was speaking at Secret Knock, and I was staring at him, listening to this story of how this man had these trials and tribulations as a child, and he ended up creating the Make-A-Wish Foundation. At the very end of his story, he said, if I can do it, everyone can be a hero. And I was sitting in that audience, hearing him say those words, and I never thought of myself as a hero. I never thought of myself as anything important because I had been told for many years in my life, growing up in an abusive alcoholic household, that you're not worthy, you're not valued, you're stupid, you're ignorant. And those are the words I believed about myself. But when Frank said those words on that stage, after inspiring me while I was sitting there listening to him, I said, oh, I am no different than anybody else in this room except I took a different path in life. I can get on this different path that they're on. And I did. And that's when I started surrounding myself with people like Frank Shankwitz, like Greg Reed, like the founder of Ugg Boots, Brian Smith, like the inventor of the credit card magnetic strip, Ron Klein. Later, I asked these gentlemen, I'm writing a book, will you be in it? And they all said, yes, of course we will. So my point here is that it's the stories that we hear that can impact our lives in whatever way, shape or form that we choose for them to impact our lives. Those stories happen to impact me in a way that helped me to step into myself, to become a bigger, bolder, stronger, more confident woman that I had been before, but I lost myself. So here I am today, this book, you know, we mentioned books earlier, Momentum, 13 Lessons from Action Takers Who Changed the World, that book is coming out soon because I asked these gentlemen, would you be part of my story? And so it's just like, put yourself out there. You never know how your story is going to impact somebody else's life. Like Frank's story truly impacted me and helped me to become a better person. Yeah, well, storytelling, right? That's what it comes back to. And, uh, the, and I like the word you use in there. It's one I, I like to use a lot, impact. And I think, you know, you heard me sort of say in the beginning, Linda, that uh, kind of encouraging people that you everybody's got a story. And you might think that your story doesn't matter or it's not as big as the guy over there or the lady over there. Um, but uh, I know I've had that experience on my show. I've had those days where I'm like, I'm done. I'm not doing this. Nobody cares. Nobody's watching. Uh, I don't feel like I'm having a fact and i've been doing this for years i'm wasting you know and i next thing you know i catch myself having this negative talk going on in my head and then i and then a message just seems to show up i get a message from somebody i don't even know or i'm out in my community because it's so directly uh, related to my community somebody walks up to me and says oh you're dave burrows you do i watch your show all the time and, I, and, and they just say something and you're like that's all I, that's all I needed. And and I might even tell that person, say, you know what? You just made my, my day. And they might think I made your day. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so all those stories um, uh, are really that, that impact. Everybody's got that impact in there. And that's, uh, You've, you've, you've met some, uh, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit jealous. I, I know some of the people you talk about and uh, and still watch and read, you know, Les Brown and and uh, and Canfield and all those guys, right, you know, and I've seen them or whatever. And uh, I remember seeing, uh, it was, was Jack and Les in Toronto here, actually, a few years ago. And I remember being all done and, and, and then I just left. And then when I was going home, I was like, why didn't I stick around? You know, I don't know. I might've had to be somewhere or whatever, but um, yeah, you've got, and I, I get the same thing with some of the people that, that, that I've interviewed from, you know, like uh, people from uh, the, you might not know some of these are Canadian bands, but the band Helix and uh, members of the tragically hip and uh, David Wilcox and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the road manager for Leonard Skinner. And he talks about the plane crash and, and people, you know, how did you, how did you get those interviews? What? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? all that you're asking me. Well, I just want to really, really, okay, really, yeah. really 
really quick story about Jack Canfield. That was a really interesting one because I had raised my hand and said, I want to interview stars on the red carpet at the Academy Awards after party. And the person organizing said, okay. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be on the red carpet interviewing stars. How am I going to do this? I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know stars. I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies, you know? So I don't even know who any stars are. But when I showed up at the event, it was lunchtime and Jack Canfield was in the hall talking to three people. And I was like, oh my God, that's Jack Canfield. I want to get a picture with him. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted was a picture. And then what happened was as they were finishing up their conversation, the three people turned one way. Jack Canfield happened to turn toward me out of the blue, said, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get some lunch. He said it out loud. And so I grabbed him by the arm and I said, I didn't grab him. I gently touched his arm and I said, hey, Jack, I'm going to take you to lunch like that. And he goes, OK. So we went to lunch together. I never met him. He never met me. And I it was so interesting because as we walked to lunch, it was about, I don't know, a quarter of a mile distance to the lunch place. People were accosting him. Jack, sign my book. Jack, you got to look at my this. Jack, Jack. Everybody was accosting him. So when we showed up at the lunch venue, it was just a Mexican restaurant in town there. I said, Jack, I just want to let you know, I am not here to take anything from you. I'm just here to be in your presence. And he was like, oh, I could see that relief from him. And so later that night, when we were on the red carpet, here comes Jack Canfield. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to get to interview him, you know. And so he goes, oh, here's my lunch buddy. And he was so cool. And I interviewed him. And you know what was really cool is at the very end, I got smart. And I said to myself, I'm going to get a quick testimonial from him. So I said, hey, Jack, why don't you tell the audience what you love about me? And he did. So I have this amazing testimonial from Jack Canfield just because, again, I asked. It's all about asking. What do you want? Like David left and and is like, why didn't I? Right. So I try to live my life without the why didn't I's with no regrets. And that's really what's been happening with my life as I go on, because I'm like, I don't want to pass up this opportunity. So I excuse my dogs in the background, but, but yeah, right. there, and there's so many stories like that because I've been saying, you know, raising my hand and just asking for what I want. And do, do you still do you keep the receipt from lunch? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what? it was only thirty eight dollars. Like we both ordered just a Mexican uh, menu and water, right? But when we got back to the venue this was an event. It was an Academy Awards after party venue. Right. And so when we got back there, my friends were like, you and Jack, like, what's going on? You went to lunch with Jack Canfield. And I go, yeah, oh, it was just Jack and I, you know, and then (laughs) somebody said, did you hear that two people bid on lunch with him? $14,000 each. And I was like, mine was $38. Mine was 38 bucks and a quarter mile walk. (laughs) Exactly. But it was amazing. And then I saw him at another event. He was like, hi, Linda, how are you doing? So it was cool. He remembered me and I didn't think he would ever remember me, but he did, you know, and it's, he's just a really good guy. That's a great story. And uh, thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, again, the word impact and actually two words that I always teach my, uh, my students, uh, impact and relationships, right? If you can yeah. put those two together, uh, you can really uh, change the world for sure. Uh, Linda, we're going to come back to you in a little bit. I want to move on over to uh, Fonz Chamberlain, the Cambridge Hi. historian. Uh, different type of stories, but uh, some, some, and this is the, I just want to make it clear. This is the real Fonz, just so you know. Yeah. The other Fonz was an imitation. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's even, that's the funny thing is meeting Henry Winkler. Um, great guy. Um, and I did meet him and he stood up and like he was signing because I I didn't say who I was. I was in a queue and I had the annual that my mum said, Hey, because it's my brother's, I'm gonna name my kid a different name and oh look, I'm gonna call him Fonz. So that's where it came from. And I'd always kept that and I took it so he could sign it and he was actually promoting a new book and the people mm-hmm. said he, he won't sign anything unless you're buying a book. And I thought, okay, fair enough. So I, like you say, you take those chances and those risks. And I sat down and go, you couldn't sign my annual for me. And he looked at me, he goes, okay. 
yeah, not a problem, right? And he and he goes, who's it for? I go, it's for Fonz. And he goes, oh, you want me to write it from Fonz? And I go, no, I am Fonz. <laughs> then all these pressed like camera people there that were doing interview all just suddenly turned on me. And it was like, whoa, what's going on here? And it was amazing. And he got up, he gave me a hug on just saying that. And then as we got talking, he, t he told the press and the media, well, what I can say is I played the fonts, but this guy is 100% the real fonts. So that, that was mm. nice of him to do that. Yeah, but, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I, I said, uh, I have an imitation font. No, I'm saying he's the real fonts. The other guy was the imitation. <laughs> <laughs> the real fonts right here. How did, how did that, that, that had to make you feel pretty good, you know, that uh, when you talk about impact, how did that impact you and, and how old were you when that happened? Uh, it was a few years ago, uh, about probably about 10 years ago now. Um, I don't know. It's, I grew up thinking, oh, I'm never going to never get to see him. And I had tried other ways to meet up with him. But probably when you med mess messaging his publicity staff, my name's Fonz. I can imagine they thought this guy must be a psycho. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so they they didn't take much notice. And but I think he must have been aware that one day this guy's gonna walk up and say his name is Fonz <laughs> by his reaction. So he knew that was the day. And it was it was surreal, really, because when I'm standing next to him and all these cameras are flashing at me and it was just surreal thinking that's him there right next to me. And the next day, the scariest thing about it, though, the next day I had newspapers on my doorstep wanting to take photos with me holding the book so they could put it an article in a newspaper. Oh, wow. And and they said, like they were saying to me, you do an interview. And I go, yeah, that's fine. But the only scary thing about it is how did you work out where I lived? So... Where, uh, where my house was, so that then then they wouldn't tell me no either. So they seem to then the media if they want to find you, they'll find you. <laughs> right. Well, I guess uh, they 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 want their stories too, right? And they they're willing to seek out the people that uh, maybe can tell those stories the same way, maybe for a different reason, but the same way we might seek those stories oh, out definitely. too, right? Yeah. What is it about what is it about uh, uh, history that uh, like because you've had a radio show on history, et cetera, yeah. and you are known as the Cambridge historian. Yeah. What is it about Cambridge that has fascinated you so much? When look, my family goes back generations in Cambridge uh, and the surrounding villages um, in a local village, Shepherd, that's where my father's side of the family was. And if you walk in the village hall, all there's all these plaques and everybody who's done something in Shepherd's last name's Chamberlain. Then you take a trip down the graveyard and most of the graves are Chamberlain. So it's like been a big family connection. And my mum lived and grew up in Cambridge and her family. And being like the next generation walking around Cambridge, uh, I was always fascinated about how it changed and i got a book by a guy called fred umwin who, and he was a local guy and he turned down publishing contracts he self-published his own books talking about his life in cambridge and he used to go door to door knocking on doors selling them and he wouldn't give in until he sold at least 20 books a day i think it was wow. and i got one of his books uh about Cambridge, uh, called Cambridge, um, I think it's from one and all, and it was about the Second World War, and there was a section in it about bombings in Cambridge, and I took a walk to one of the streets where this had happened, and it sort of like overtook me. I was only about getting my brother to drag, take dragging my brother there, saying, you've got to take me, and just about 10 or 11, imagining how it used to look and from that i'd walk around why is that street called that why was that building put there what was there before that and then i go and start reach researching stuff looking stuff up 
And before before you know it, my family were getting fed up of me because I walked down there and go, you know what us call Fitz? Roy Street, don't you? And I go, yeah, why? Named after Augustus Henry Fitzroy. That's why. And like, okay. And it sort of like was a personal thing. And it then led to radio, first of all. And I took a small job on uh, just getting news stories together because back in that, Back in the early days when I was doing it, you had somebody who put together news stories for the presenter to read. And the uh, station manager, Carl, uh, found out about my interest in history and asked me to do a show. And I go, oh, nobody's interested in that. You know what I mean? You need to get a professional to do it. He goes, but you are. You know everything he goes and he said to tell me something so i told him a few things he goes but there you go you can go and do it you're our professional like and then stuck me in a studio and told me to just go with it and i said okay i'll do one show and a special over the easter period at, at that time and put that together and he contacted me a few days later saying your show is the most reactions that we've had. We've even had a lady on the phone crying, saying how you brought memories back to her and we want you to carry on. And that's where it carried on from there and progressed and progressed. And then I got involved with history groups, organisations, invited to schools to, to talk to children about local history, um, doing walks. I did a, a walking. Uh, I got arrested once uh, <laughs> because I did a walk and it was an open walk. Uh, it was an event on Facebook where you invite people, but everybody shared it and there wasn't a limit and it was a ghost walk. And over a hundred, I think 130 people sat on the market square in Cambridge wanting to go on this ghost walk and the police were involved because they thought I was trying to start a riot. <laughs> well, you look like a scary character. <laughs> There's no Stephen read my mind. I'll bring that up. Uh, Linda's actually asking the question, were yeah. you scared your first time? What? Radio. Yeah, like the story you just told there, I'm thinking, you know, the first time you went and did the radio show. Well, he was quite clever. Uh, my He actually got me talking on the radio and just saying, oh, don't worry, nobody can hear you because my the first bit that I did, my show, was all edited together. It actually, I think it took me over 18 hours to edit together, um, right. much quicker these days. But the first bit, he goes, just try it out, just talk in here and just chat to me and we're chatting along. And what I didn't know was that we were actually live on the air. And he told me <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> he goes, see, you can do it. You've just been live. Well, you, you maybe talk yourself out of it a little bit, right? There's that, that yeah. self-talk. In the, but, you know, no, it's a really good story because, again, impact. And, and you were really thinking, like what I said earlier to our viewers, like you think you don't think you have a story, no. but it's in there. Yeah. Um, well, I you think you were not the right person that brought it out of you, right? Yeah, exactly. And you just mean I – not because it's anybody's fault or my family's fault. Uh, they just got, they weren't interested. My kids can't stand history and got no interest <laughs> at all. And everybody that I was around didn't share the similar interests. So they weren't interested. And I suppose in my head that I thought, well, it's only me who likes it. Other people ain't going to be interested. And Cole come along and actually, no, it made me realize there are people. Uh, that are interested and not everybody will but history's banned when i'm talking to the family and um i have to i have to walk around cambridge like zippy you know out of rain i don't know if you've ever seen rainbow i'm not allowed to say anything so right <laughs> well, so even with the success that you have today you're still banned from talking about history in the family uh well no in like when i'm yeah, but you know, like, when it's family time, no, like, oh, yeah, and that kind of thing. And like when we're shopping, because I do have a habit of doing it, I go, 
Oh, there was a chip shop over there. Yes, we know what it was before. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, great stories, and again, the impact and uh, history. Talk about relationships and, well, impact history there for sure. Juan, thanks for sharing that. We'll come back to you with some more, and uh, let's give some time to our friend Joe Shepard. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm very excited to hear uh, some of your stories as it's the first time I've been able to, uh, to, to you know, collaborate with yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, honestly, I love hearing people's stories. I could sit all day and, like I say, the Irish over here have an old expression. It's a great storytelling region called the Shanaki, you know, the storyteller who would sit there. So for me, it, it's one of those things where you can sit and do all day long. And I thought to myself, well, what stories do I have? I, I, I've met some pretty, you know, what I call key persons of influence, as Daniel Priestley would call them, um, in my life. No one in this. Great. Listen, reaching out. It wasn't who we've met. It's the way you did it. You know, that fires you up that, you know, you, you will always miss 100% of those chances. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, if, <coughs> but sometimes they come to you. <coughs> so if we've got time at the end, I'll explain to you how I met the president of Ireland, an author in the hair and um, and he came to me. <clears throat> so that's quite, a, quite an interesting story of how sometimes the key persons of influence can, can come to you. But <clears throat> one of the stories I wanted to share was um, uh, a couple of months ago, we, we, we've, uh, one of our rugby shows, uh, one, of, one of the things we like to do is not just cover mainstream, we want to cover non-mainstream. So mixed ability, visually impaired, wheelchair, women's tag, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm make that as use the platform to be able to give that as a shout out so <clears throat> excuse me there's um this guy called ian mckinley he played uh, he's irish he played in ireland and he lost an eye a few years ago in a tragic accident uh, on the field one of his own players put a boot on him when he was in the rock on the floor and he lost his eye eventually he came back but to coaching he now is uh you know plays for the top italian team he, he is resident in italy so he plays for italy as well and he has special glasses that he wears He's a brand ambassador for a, an organization in London called the Change Foundation and uh, as their uh, visually impaired uh, rugby brand ambassador. And so we had him on the show and we told that story. And that's so uplifting about how you can overcome adversity at any level. And it's just a phenomenal story to hear as a host to, to get through. And then but you, you don't know how you're impacting on other people's lives about Four hours after the show had finished, and I can read this because the guy has said, because we've used this, okay? It's not just the story you're telling or somebody's telling through you. It's that impact you have on somebody else's life. And I got a, a, a guy called Paul Handley who sent me a message through, through my main page. And it just popped up. You got a message I picked out. Just wanted to let you know that you have changed my life or at least certain aspects of it. I have an eye condition for which I'm now registered as partially blind. I saw your interview um, a while back and got in touch uh, with uh, Bass, the, the Change Foundation, directly. Um, I'm a big Harlequins fan, and I've started traveling once a month now for training from Northern Ireland across to the mainland in, Lon in London. I bloody love it. Just before the lockdown, we had a tournament uh, that was going to be going on, um, and it was cancelled. It, it was the moment of his, his life it was going to be. The visually impaired rugby team really showed up and uh, took um, lots of photographs for the day. I'm about to go and do more and more. This has changed my life. That in itself. So what we've done with uh, Paul now is uh, we've got another new show that's starting tomorrow on, on Ulster Rugby. Ulster is one of the four provinces of Ireland. We've now got him as part of that team covering visually impaired rugby. So his journey now continues. And and uh, look, it, and that's what we do with everybody. It, it's that it's it's a story from somebody else that you're helping to share you, we don't know you, the point you made before david is sometimes like we we'll have our difficult days and yet we'll still show up on camera we'll do like you know happy smiley big joe chef you, you asked me before it would be just yes. big joe chef i've been called that since i was 14. sometimes we've got a happy smiley face on it's the old tears of a clown thing because we commit to do it and then we go and we crawl away again because we have the same things as other people same difficulties the same worries the same concerns and you know we, we go through these things but when you get something like that out of the blue it, it just shows you actually that impact that you are having directly and indirectly at so many different levels and how you know now his journey can continue and his story can be told 
through the same medium. I think one of the things that live streaming does, and you're right, brother, what you said at the beginning, David, live streaming can, and in fact does, change lives completely. So it's, you know, I, I can't wait to get him on and he will now be a, a, a guest. He'll, in fact, he'll be a host. We're going to do one of the shows about visually impaired rugby in the province and, you know, on his journey as well. So he will then in turn inspire other people and connect those stories going. So they're all shanaki from the 16th, 17th, 1800s, the storytellers. Are, we're doing the same thing. It's just a modern approach. I, 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 I've got XSplit. I was going to put a fancy background up. You know, one of the things I just love being me. I, when I gave everything up six years ago, 50, you know, I'm a coach, a mentor, a train the trainer, a presentation skills advisor, all sorts of stuff. But, you know, the hardest thing in the world was I had to go back to being me so that I was relatable to others so I could tell a story without having to worry about anything. And that's that's just one example of of uh, with for Paul Handley and connecting him with and stories and those stories now keep on going that fires me yeah. up well i was going to that's a good way to put it fires you up because the the you can tell the impact that it's had on you just by the yeah. way you're presenting the story right and you get uh, hey guilty i think we're probably all guilty as charged uh, on uh, boy i could just talk about this one particular subject or that one moment in time that that really uh, you know, what do we call it? The aha moment that affected us to, you know, Linda talked very well about how shy she was and was the one that sat in the back corner and never sat in the front row. And just to put her hand up and ask a question uh, was a, was the challenge that uh, uh, she pushed through and, and, and got her through. So, you know, your story there, uh, a lot of passion in there and i love that right it's and i, I think that's uh you know again what we're talking about here today for those of you just joining us is storytelling and the impact that it really can have on lives and not just the way you tell the story out but the ones you know you get that message all of a sudden and you realize that what you're doing well you matter and what you're doing matters and your your story that you told uh, it just comes full circle right so uh, thanks for sharing that, Joe. And I, I like the natural background. I don't normally use XSplit, except when Stephen and he, Stephen Healy and I are doing our show that we do every week. Uh, but this is this is the real me right back in here. Um, this is my my studio here in in Canada. And uh, you know, I I uh, I've never really thought of myself as a storyteller. Um, I've always been the interview guy. Um, lately, I've been having people reach out to me and asking them to be on their show, which I actually found quite awkward in the beginning because I'm usually the one, and I guess maybe it's all of the control thing or uh, I'm the one asking the questions, that sort of thing. It's been very flattering lately, and, and I'm seeing other people using platforms that I use to to go and go live, right, and, and tell their stories. And, um, you know, I... I, I I guess, but I realized that the way I tell a story is by helping other people share their stories. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, my story, you know, because uh, mine's typically community based here in Sarnia Lampton, uh, 73,000 people. So it's always about a, you know, a charity or somebody uh, in the community having a positive impact or a musician, uh, politicians. Um, and, um, it's been actually leading up to this broadcast today. I put on my thinking cap. Well, what story? I mean, I have a lot of stories I could tell, but what am I a storyteller? I guess maybe I, I just never put that title on it before, right? You know, um, I'm a, I'm a collaborator, like Linda likes to call. I'm a I'm a sharer. I'm I'm an interest person because I I genuinely have an interest in people. Um, as much as I love to talk and I, I know when it's my turn, like when I, if I do some motivational speaking that day, if I'm the sports announcer that day, uh, it's my turn to talk. When I'm the person doing a show and interviewing people, it's not my turn to talk. It's my, 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 and I say term, it's not my term to talk. It's my term to listen. Um, and I've learned so much about, um, uh, I, I remember, you know, you heard me say earlier about I'm writing a book and uh, so far I've just got a title, <laughs> um, but you got to have an episode one. 
And, uh, you know, like before coming into this world, I was, uh, I was a karaoke host. I was a professional karaoke host for 20 plus years. That's what was my career. I was a DJ. I uh, did a little bit of radio, some entertaining. Um, and then life changed about nine years ago. And what am I going to do? I'm going to start this show. That's a, that's a whole other story in itself. Um, and, and, um, I had to learn to listen, right? I mean, there's storytelling is good, but uh, learning to listen is a, is a, is a part of storytelling in a sense too, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that, that, uh, for, for me, the, the, the journey of where I am now, like it'll be nine years in November, I've had my show and, um, the impact that it's had on me listening to the stories you know we're talking here today about storytelling but we forget that aspect of listening to the stories and you know, i do um uh, i narrate audible books now for for amazon and uh, audible and, and 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 itunes and i said to my wife the other day i remember somebody saying to me i can't remember it might have been jeff olson or zig ziglar or somebody once uh, said to me or i read you know, if I came up to you and said, uh, David, I, I know how to change your life. Here's 12 books. Take these 12 books and go read them. If I said that to you, you'd go, whoa, I can't read 12 books. But if I said to you, read 10 pages of a good book every day. And if the average book is 365 pages, read 10 pages a day. And guess what? At the end of a year, you've read 12 books. And, 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 and that's something you can do, right? You can do 10 pages of a good book. You can't read 12 books, right? Because of the way we, we, we look at that. And I said to my, my wife, Jennifer, the other day, I said, you know, I'm really excited about doing this, this narration of books because, first of all, uh, a lot of times I'm doing bestsellers. Um, you know, I'm, I just finished narrating a book for Danny Hewitt, who is the son of uh, Liberty Tax, Right. You know, and and uh, that's quite an amazing story. So I'm getting to narrate that book, and as I'm reading through the book, there was some things in there that I had already read, but it reaffirmed. And I'm like, if I'm doing three books a week, times fifty, never I'll take two weeks off in the air. What's three times fifty? I warned her. I said, uh, look out, because I'm going to be I'm going to be really super smart in a year. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that 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 knowledge uh, of and and the opportunity to be able to do that. So you want to talk about being a storyteller, narrating other people's stories. For me, right now, is an absolute joy. Uh, you could call it a dream job. Like I do multiple things that 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 makes my full time career in this. This is what I do. I I, I teach part time at our local college. I've been able to. Uh, I created the, the the first live streaming course in all of Canada uh, to, to teach at our uh, college, and boy, there's a story. Um, and when I when I talk with my students, you heard me say earlier, you know, I share with my students, you know, uh, impact and relationships, accountability. Um, a lot of them get pleasantly surprised by the philosophy that I put into the course because they're like, "Well, I, I'm, and I'm just one." class in that entire course right and i'm talking branding and philosophies and like what does this have to do with live streaming i'm glad you asked that question right you know and then we get into that talking what's your story how can you impact somebody's life with your story um you might save a life it might not save a life it might not be on that level it might just be giving somebody somewhere to show up for an hour of their time because they have nowhere else to go. It might be how to play that video game. It might be what we're doing here right now, right? I like the encouragement um, of, 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 of getting people to tell their stories because I wonder how much we don't know yet. I wonder how much we're missing because there are people wanting to tell a story but haven't been maybe you know like linda had to be pulled out into the front row there's some people we need to we need to pull them into the front row and we got to find those people and, and encourage them and the more we do these kind of things um the, i think the more greatness we can see in this world with the live streaming and that as that tool right 
Um, you know, you hear putting your best foot forward and, you know, showing up even when you don't want to. Um, and uh, um, a person uh, I met in person one time and he's not a real popular guy these days. So I won't say his name, but that guy. Um, but, but he gave some great advice one day. Don't quit. Don't quit. If you get in a boxing ring and the other guy you're fighting never quits, you can't beat him. <laughs> right? And it's it, the and, and how does this relate to storytelling? And why am I telling this part of the story? Because it's it's all about your thought process, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not coming up with anything new that that uh, Jack Canfield or Les Brown or any of the greats haven't said. Um, but we need to keep doing it. We need to keep encourage that philosophy. I've always thought, you know, you say to you, you might say to your child, um, you, uh, you better change your attitude or you're going to be in trouble. No, you don't need to change your attitude. You need to change your philosophy because it starts here, right? Fix the philosophies and that will affect the attitude, hopefully. And I really, I, I've, I've, it's, that's the side I could go. I'm maybe heading in a different direction that I, that I don't need to today, but I really believe that this is, I was so looking forward to this today because of the title storytelling and, and it's the impact that we're having here today. Who knows who's watching that isn't typing hello. I guarantee you folks, the story you're telling is the person you don't even know. They're, the, 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 the person on stage didn't know Linda. Jack didn't know Linda before lunch. Mm -mm. You know, Fonz, you can come to my place for dinner anytime, talk history all you want at my dinner table, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, anyway, I, I and, and here's the other thing. You have to learn when to stop too. So I'm, I'm going to take my little pause here, but I, I, I really encourage everybody to find your story and start sharing. Can I just, one thing on the back of that. We, yeah, um, absolutely. There's, you're absolutely right what you said. There are people out there who, up until four or five months ago, uh, w were afraid of being on the camera. It's now become more, oh, Jesus, it's like the Industrial Revolution has changed. But what we did <laughs> in our show was I would constantly, I sent about 90 or so rugby forums, which keeps me quite busy, <clears throat> just across Facebook. But I source out people who are engaging, because it's very easy to see, see the weed from the chaff when somebody puts a comment and you think they'll be good just on that alone. So I then reach out to them. I engage with them. I then explain, I then expand on the explanation of who I am, what I'm doing and why I want them to, to come on a show and speak. And the first thing you get is, ah, oh, Jesus, big fella. Uh, thanks very much for the offer, but I don't think we do. So I created a thing called Fan in Five, where we get them on a show. We do a bit of rehearsal before we get them on a show and we ask them five, five, uh, six to eight minutes, five questions who they are, where they're from, what they do, their involvement with rugby, why they love it, and you can see them coming out. 85% of my panelists globally started as fans in five. Now I can't get some of the buggers off. Um, but they, they, that little bit of a story they tell is enough to the next story. And then they become the me, when they become a, a co-host yeah. or a panelist. And they're then recanting stories and they're finding people to introduce. And, and so it's just that small bit at the beginning sometime. It's that reaching out to that small person in the same way as Linda expertly reaches out to, to, to the big people because they don't know what they don't know. But sometimes as I've never, class, I, I'm saying I've never thought myself as a storyteller, but I tell stories about people, with people, through people, on behalf of people, and I engage to bring them on to tell. So I think this whole storytelling thing can cover a myriad rather than just, I'm a storyteller. I think that engagement thing, that collaboration yeah. thing, it's all part of being able to tell a story, tell the story, if you like, Rodman. Well, you know, it's interesting. I wanted yeah. to mention, because I wrote this down, Joe, you said, um, Something about key persons of influence. influence. It's a book by Daniel Creasley. And oh, okay, I, I hadn't heard about that before. But here's the thing: is that we all are key persons of influence Absolutely. to somebody. And so, even though, like I mentioned those names, I've interviewed over 450 people. Not all of them are famous people. I just mentioned those names. And sure. I'm just like um, David. You know, it's like I'm very curious. 
I ask a lot of questions. I used to be called a busybody. Uh, you like you ask too many questions, but you know what? That's what I do well because I'm very curious. And so I started interviewing people that podcast, you know, interviewing them on my show and stuff. And what I realized is this was, this happened just yesterday. I was, um, I reached out to this woman on LinkedIn. She works in the nonprofit sector and I love working with nonprofits. I have my own nonprofit. And so I reached out to her and said, Hey, let's get on a call. So we got on this call and I found out uh, some things about her, you know, her past that she had some things that were scary for her. Well, when we got off that at the end of that call, she asked me this question and it was, why did, and it was like this, why did you reach out to me? Like she didn't feel she had any value. And so I told her, I said, you're, you know, you have, you're the type of person that I like to hang out with people who are, you know, into making a positive impact on this planet. And so she sent me a message afterwards and she said, in 30 minutes, because our call was 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, you made me feel seen and heard. It's something I haven't experienced since I've been in the United States. She's from Africa. So with what's going on right now, especially in our climate, mm -hmm. she's experiencing like this really drastic change from her life in Africa to what's going on here. And so why would I reach out to her? Like it was her thing, right? But she yeah. was so, so absolutely amazing. But my point there is that I happened to be in that moment, a key person of influence in her life, somebody she needed to see and hear, somebody she needed to connect with. So we all have that opportunity. We yeah, all have absolutely. that opportunity. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's a, uh, and I want to take that. Uh, wow. You know, before we went live today, we were like, oh boy, will we be able to do an hour? And Stephen was like, oh yeah, the four of you know, we could probably do 10 hours. And oh, here we are, but four minutes away from an hour. And um, um, I want to hear one more from you, Fonz, but just yes. before we do, because I've got Linda, just a touch of a video that we're going to play here. We're going to get Stephen oh, yeah. to play about uh, maybe 30 seconds of that video. Lead us into that and then I'll come over to you, Fonz. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I had this opportunity to interview Kevin Harrington, the original shark of Shark Tank. And uh, here's just a, a snapshot of the interview. And the reason I wanted to share this is because um, he is a master storyteller. So Stephen, play the role. <laughs> From the hey there, TV show Kevin Shark Harrington, an original West. shark from the hit TV show Shark Tank. I'm here with Linda West and, and Linda. You've got an amazing publication I'm and you tell interview that we're going to be doing here today. Awesome. Thank you so much, I'm Kevin. I'm going to let you tell everybody about it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm really blessed to be here with you. Thank you for giving me this time because I know time is the. I lead a mastermind accountability program and I love this program because it gives people an opportunity, these entrepreneurs, an opportunity to really tap into their brilliance and to share their value with others and held each other accountable. So I want to know from you, like, how has accountability Accountability played a part in your life and your success. Well, so I love when you said a mastermind with accountability. I right away said that's brilliant because masterminds are good at generating lots of ideas, yes. lots of energy and things. But you have to take action after a mastermind, right? You've got to, you, you get a lot of benefits out of a mastermind. I've created some amazing businesses out of masterminds. I, I've got a, in the last two years, I can track one guy at a mastermind that we created a hundred million dollar business together coming out of there but i had to take massive action steps which is the accountability factor and so um i say that when when you come out of a mastermind not everything everyone gives you a lot of great ideas yes. you've got to be able to take them and put them in a priority arrangement of what are the ones that you can actually accomplish first best and up uh, and and some that maybe won't happen right away oh i muted okay there we go <laughs> okay thanks okay. for sharing that. that that had to be a real big uh a thrill for you 
Yeah, it was interesting because um, I reached out to his assistant and asked if I could interview him. And she said, yes. So we made it happen. But what I really loved about Kevin Harrington is right before we went live, he goes, what do you want me to talk about? And it was really cool because I got to say, I want to talk about accountability. So he like moved right on into it. And so it's really like when we're interviewing people, we have an opportunity to have them help us by using their celebrity in ways that can help us. How do we leverage these celebrities? How did I leverage Les Brown? You know, how did I leverage, you know, Jack Canfield? So it's like, how do we set ourselves up so that we can receive the results that we want to receive? Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that uh, video there with us today. Uh, Fonz, we're, we're almost out of time, but I've got, I've always got time for you. Wrap things up here for hey, you. Happy days. Um, yeah, no, something I was going to say about people who are not able to tell their story. Um, I've realized, well, I so I've been told that I'm a good example of why, where I, where I live, why you should be telling your story. Because when I looked at history, um, being in a university city in Cambridge, you thought, well, it's basically all universities um, that the story, uh, the guided walks would be, be about by university people or professors with letters after the names or doctors. And you think, oh, I'm just an average Joe off the street. Um, I, I'd never do that. I'd never do that. And I, I suppose in some people's eyes, so I've been told that proved that you can do that as well so you should never think that your story is not important because just because the world shows you it one way doesn't mean it actually is that way and you could change the world yourself yeah uh absolutely great advice and, and yeah. uh, another well, great story right but the, but the funny thing is um but I mentioned some names of other people that did history in Cambridge. And this lady said to me, yep, yeah, the difference is between you and them. They may have letters after their name and before their name and um, in a high position, but none of them ever lived in Cambridge. None of them were ever born in Cambridge. You were born in a street in Cambridge and grew up in Cambridge. And that makes you more of an expert than what they are. And it was like, wow. I'd never see it like that before. And it sort of all made sense. Yeah. Google Google the word perspective. <laughs> and uh, when, you, when you take read that definition, come up with your own definition of what perspective is and what is your story. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you, we all challenge you, I think, to think about your story. And you know what? I think we got a new show here, quite honestly, because we're coming around from all parts of the world. If we could all four of us coordinate our time and, and talk Stephen into producing, we uh, we just might have a big hit here because there's an endless supply of stories. Um, I'm in. But we are out of time. Yeah, right? I, I put Linda's got her hand up for that one. There you go. I'm always raising my hand. <laughs> Um, I wish we had more time. I know I've got a, another show I've got to prepare for, and and uh, I know we've uh, I've got to take some time to do other things. But Linda, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I really was looking forward to everybody being here, but uh, I hadn't connected with you in some time, so that was great. Fonz, nice to see you again. I am enjoying your book, and uh, Joe, I'm looking forward to uh, the future of our relationship as well. And thanks to our friend Stephen Healy. A round of applause to him for taking care of everything, producing, and setting up five days live. Tomorrow there's going to be another five days live. You can keep an eye on the Facebook page where you're watching from today for more details on that. And it's going to happen all this week. We want to impact you, so stay tuned for more. Until next time, I've been your host, David Burroughs. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. Bye, everybody.